The Ascendant Quran, realigning man to the divine power culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best known Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad al Asi. Three volumes of this multi volume tafsir are now available from Crescent International at a special price of $40 per volume, including shipping anywhere in North America. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Zafar Bangash. Welcome to Muslim Perspectives. Today we have a very special guest, Brother Afif Khan, who is on the editorial board of Crescent International. He's also a member of the Institute of Contemporary Islamic Thought. But more particularly, uh, Brother Afif is the editor of the monumental tafsir that Imam Muhammad al Asi is producing, titled The Ascendant Quran realigning man to the divine power culture. We are fortunate to have him on our program today and we are going to talk to Brother Afif about some of the aspects of this tafsir. Brother Afif, welcome to the program. Thank you. Asalaamu Alaikum. Now, let's begin with uh, dealing with this issue. Uh, there are so many translations of the Quran. There are so many tafasir of the Quran in different languages. Uh, the question that uh, many people ask is, what is the need or why was it felt that there should be another uh, tafsir of the Quran? Uh, throughout Muslim history, uh, Islamic scholars uh, have been trying uh, their best to acquaint uh, the average Muslim with the meaning of the Quran and uh, as we know that meanings of the Quran are transcendental and uh, uh, in every age at every time in every place uh, Muslims are, are expected uh, to conduct their affairs with a certain reference point and it's essential for them to understand uh, the meanings of the Quran uh, because this is their reference point and uh, and so Islamic scholars of the past, they have tried uh, to uh, render uh, the meanings of the Qur'an in their particular time and place uh, so that uh, their societies uh, can function smoothly uh, with the Qur'an and uh, the example of the Prophet as a reference point. And so in every age there is a necessity for tafsir literature uh, because the times and the circumstances change uh, the meanings of words that people use uh, in their discourses, they change. And so uh, it's uh, always important to update uh, the meanings uh, of the Quranic ayat uh, within the ambiance of language and within the ambiance of jargon that people are using at a particular time and place. Uh, if I could be a little bit more specific, uh, in the present day there are concepts which are known as imperialism and colonialism. Um, at the time of the Prophet wasallam, there were no such words. Uh, the concept may have been there. Uh, we, uh, the concept was of course there and the Quran is characterized as taghut. But uh, we need a mufassir to write a tafsir in the present day to help us understand that the meaning of the word taghut in the Quran is exhibited by the characteristics today of imperialism, colonialism and Zionism. And, and so this is why we need tafsir literature uh, in every age and, and we feel that this is why this particular tafsir is very important. The tafsir literature that is out there right now uh, doesn't capture some of these uh, systems of oppression uh, in the way that this particular uh, tafsir does and acquaint them with Quranic diction and Quranic words. Has there ever been a tafsir uh, produced uh, directly in the English language? Uh, this is the first of Sir which is being produced directly in the English language, uh, meaning that it is written in English. Uh, the other tafsirs that you find uh, that have been rendered into English are translations either from Urdu or from Arabic. Uh, it's important uh, to talk about this just a little bit because English uh, is the lingua franca in the world. Uh, it is the language that the power culture in the, wor in the world uses. Uh, there are many, many Muslims in the English-speaking part of the world. Uh, uh, they're oppressed in a certain way uh, because they have no access to the real meanings of the Qur'an because all of the translations and the tafsirs in English fall short uh, or they're outdated 
And so what this particular tafsir does is that uh, uh, it renders the meanings of the Qur'an uh, in the English language as limited as it is uh, to help people understand the world that they live in. And uh, the only way that they can really and truly understand the world that they live in is to have a reference point like the Qur'an. Without that, without a reference point of the Qur'an, you're constrained to try to understand the world through the power culture of the people who dominate in power positions. And uh, they can only help you understand the world through their eyes. And so Allah Ta'ala is trying to liberate man and so uh, he's revealed the Qur'an and guidance to us as a reference point to be able to try to understand the world that we live in. Now, let's uh, look at uh, some English translations um, that have also uh, quite a few uh, explanatory notes and commentary attached to it. For instance, um, Abdullah Yusuf Ali's uh, The Meaning of the Holy Quran, or um, the uh, or Muhammad Asad's uh, the message of the Quran, they also have uh, quite uh, a fair amount of commentary uh, in their translations. So, what is the difference between these translations and Imam Al Asi's Tafsir? Uh, uh, when you have a uh, Quran. Uh, a Quranic translation with explanatory notes. Uh, they're trying to uh, help you understand the meanings of words in a sort of a linguistic fashion. And uh, they sort of, uh, at the same time, give you very few real-world examples of what uh, these Quranic ayat mean. Uh, they don't delve into economic systems. Uh, they don't delve into uh, ideas of political representation. Uh, they don't delve into uh, the practical meanings of oppression uh, in the world that we live in. Uh, this is what the Tafsir literature does. Uh, uh, it goes much deeper than uh, simply the linguistic meanings of words. Uh, in fact, most of the translations that are available in, in English, they fall short even in so far as the linguistic meanings of words are concerned. Now, for instance, if I was to give you an example, um, let's take a look at the simple phrase Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu uh, in, most of the tafsir, in most of the translations that you look at they'll translate that as O you who believe now the word believe uh, means a certain thing in English that particular word is constrained by uh, a domain of uh, governance which has separated church from state and uh, as far as the Quranic word is concerned uh, uh, it refers to a certain group of people in society who have a political purpose. Now the word believe doesn't deliver the idea that this, that this group uh, in society has a political purpose uh, to secure and to protect society and uh, to guarantee uh, the society's covenant relationship with Allah. And so uh, when translations uh, even with explanatory notes, uh, sort of give a reductionist meaning uh, of the Qur'anic word. Uh, what the Seer literature aims to do uh, is to present that word and uh, the sequence of words in the Qur'an in as much of their full expansive meaning as possible. Okay, now we also have um, translations of uh, some of the tafasir from other languages into English. For instance, um, uh, Sayyid Qutb's uh, Fi Zilal al Quran uh, has been translated into English. Uh, Maulana Madudi's um, Tafheem al Quran has been translated from Urdu into English. And um, Ayatollah Taba Tabai, or some people refer to him as Alama Taba Tabai. Uh, his uh, Al-Mizan uh, is being translated into English from Farsi. How does uh, Imam Al-Asi's Tafsir uh, differ from these Tafsir that I've just mentioned? First of all, as far as uh, uh, these other Tafsirs are concerned, uh, uh, Imam Al-Asi, he's used uh, the tafsirs that have been written in the past uh, and uh, uh, he refers to them uh, especially uh, Sayyid Qutb's tafsir 
and uh, also he re refers to uh, uh, Ayatollah Tabatabai's tafsir as well. And in addition to that, uh, he refers to 22 other tafsirs that have been written in the past. Uh, he's found that uh, six of the more recent tafsirs, uh, of which uh, two we just mentioned, uh, they've consolidated and all of the classical tafsirs of the past and presented all of that information. Uh, what Imam al-Asi is doing uh, differently than uh, these other tafsirs is that he's concentrating on issues of power and wealth. There are a lot of people that are living in the world today and, and uh, in the past as well. They feel that power is invested in human beings and that the human beings that have power uh, have legitimacy to do as they please. And uh, what this particular tafsir concentrates on uh, are issues of power and wealth and how power uh, belongs in the hands of Allah and power that is uh, executed by man uh, needs to be disciplined by Allah's guidance. And so you'll find that, th that theme throughout the Qur'an, that theme reflects itself in how social justice is administered uh, when the power relationship between man uh, and Allah uh, is correct. And so uh, when that uh, relationship uh, has been uh, rectified and corrected, uh, then there is the possibility of having social justice on earth. Uh, what we mean again by social justice is uh, mechanisms and institutions in society uh, which uh, guarantee the average person on the street uh, generic justice, meaning equality and impartiality in so far as uh, uh, punishment or in, far, in so far as services are concerned, in so far as opportunity, the distribution of wealth, and so on and so forth. Now, you talked about uh, power and justice. How should the generic man, I'm talking about the generic man, man as, as, a, as creation of Allah, should be administering uh, these aspects of power and justice as uh, explained in the Quran? When you're talking about uh, man observing uh, ordinances and uh, uh, regulating law on earth. Uh, uh, ma man needs to have institutions uh, that uh, uh, are run by executives. Uh, it's, it's not that uh, laws uh, regulate themselves. Uh, it's not that ordinances um, uh, are self-servant. Uh, human beings uh, need to observe uh, a certain ordered way of living. And in order to do that, uh, executives have to uh, uh, head institutions that, uh, that make sure that these laws and that these ordinances are complied with. And so uh, human beings uh, set up these institutions uh, in society according to the reference points that the Qur'an delivers for them. Uh, so that uh, they have an orderly functioning uh, in society. And, and, uh, and so, uh, uh, insofar as law is concerned, and insofar as uh, running an orderly society is concerned, uh, that society needs uh, people who, makes, who make decisions on behalf of the others. Uh, and there needs to be a way uh, to choose these leaders and to choose these executives. And uh, uh, the Qur'an gives us direction about uh, how to do all of these things and what qualifications these people need uh, in order to function uh, by the consent of the people that, uh, that have chosen them. What are the Quranic uh, requirements uh, for people uh, that uh, should be chosen as leaders? Uh, well, if we could just focus on a particular ayah, uh, Allah Ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَن تُؤَدُّ الْأَمَانَاتِ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهَا وَإِذَا حَكَمْتُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ أَن تَحْكُمُوا بِالْعَدْلِ That Allah commands you to render your civic trust, meaning the trust of rule, uh, to those who are its capable executors. And if you have a chance to rule, that you do so with justice. And so the primary qualification uh, that uh, leaders or decision makers, executives have to have is that they have to have shown a track record for executing and uh, uh, implementing social justice in whatever institutions they happen to have been part of. And uh, we may look at justice as a language. Uh, it's not generally looked at that way. 
but justice is a language that is spoken between leaders and their constituencies. Uh, it's a language that uh, uh, it's a language in the world today that many leaders are incapable of speaking uh, because they have never been trained uh, to act uh, 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 with impartiality without being uh, corrupted or without being weighted down by special interests. Uh, it's a language that constituencies don't understand uh, because they have not been trained uh, to, uh, uh, to speak the language and uh, to uh, understand those who are capable of speaking that language. And uh, so there needs to be quite a bit of work on both sides. Uh, constituencies need to choose responsible leaders. Uh, leaders uh, need to behave uh, uh, with uh, principles of justice. And uh, insofar as constituencies are concerned, uh, they have demonstrated that uh, they are too often influenced by special interests uh, to be able to choose uh, the right kind of people to administer their affair uh, impartially. And on the other end of the spectrum, uh, those who happen to be in deci decision-making positions uh, get to those positions with every qualification except for impartiality and justice. So as I was saying a little bit earlier, justice is a language that is spoken between leaders and their constituencies. And uh, the disconnect between the two is because the one side doesn't understand the language, the constituencies, and the other side, the leaders, they don't know how to speak the language, uh, with the result that uh, constituencies are disconnected from their leaders, and uh, with the further result that wealth ends up being polarized in society, and then the further result of that is that power ends up being misdistributed, and when you have an imbalance of power uh, between uh, people and their leaders, then you have an imbalance of justice, and that's when oppression rules society. Okay, let us look at some specific uh, ayats in the Quran. Uh, earlier on, you mentioned uh, Allazina Amanu. Uh, how does uh, the Imam, how does Imam Al Asi's uh, translation as well as treatment of this expression uh, differ from uh, the uh, the translations of uh, earlier translators or uh, Mufassirun? Uh, yes, uh, when we're talking about Alladina uh, Amanu, Ya uh, Ayyuha Amanu, first of all, this is a form of address that Allah Ta'ala uh, gives to uh, uh, a certain uh, group of people in an Islamic society. And this is the form of address that Allah Ta'ala only uh, used when the Muslims were in uh, Al Medina after the Hijrah. And so before that, Allah Ta'ala used to characterize his address to the people as Ya Ayyuhan Nas, O people. But once the Hijrah took place uh, to Al Medina, uh, Allah Ta'ala addressed a special group of people, Ya Ayyuhan Ladina Amanu. Um, uh, as we were mentioning earlier, uh, this is a group of people that has a political purpose. And so the way that uh, Imam Al Asi uh, begins to explain the meaning of this uh, this particular phrase uh, is that he translated he translates it as "O oh, you who are securely committed to Allah." And uh, when you talk about commitment, uh, you're not talking about simply uh, conviction in the heart. You're talking about a conviction in the heart that leads to a set of transformational or, or behavioral changes on the ground, uh, meaning that you're going to conduct. Uh, your affair on earth in a certain way, uh, according to a certain reference point, according to a set of criteria that are delivered to you uh, by the most knowledgeable, the most wise, and the only power uh, on earth and, on, and in the universe. And so, Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Amanu has a specific responsibility in society. Uh, they're, uh, they're required uh, to maintain security in society, they're required to conduct treaty arrangements uh, uh, with other uh, countries, uh, other power groups in the world. Uh, they're required uh, to maintain fidelity uh, to the covenant relationship that the Islamic society has with Allah. And so you could say that in an Islamic society, Alladina Amanu are the first among equals. Uh, they have the same rights as all of the other Muslims, but they have an extra set of responsibilities. 
and uh, because they have this extra set of responsibilities, uh, uh, they are widely addressed in the ayat that were delivered in Medina to the Prophet uh, as Ya Ayyuha Ladina Amin. Uh, you could have two billion Muslims but not have a Ladina Amin. At the same time, uh, it's not a question of numbers. Uh, at the same time, you could have uh, 300 people around the Prophet and have a critical mass that's known as Al Ladina Amin. Uh, Al Ladina Amin, as we had mentioned earlier, is uh, a group. Uh, who has a singular purpose in mind of helping society observe its covenant relationship with Allah. Um, uh, Allah says in another ayah, إِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةٌ وَاحِدَةٌ وَأَنَا رَبُّكُمْ فَاعْبُدُونَ That this ummah of yours is your ummah when it is one ummah. And so uh, there are a lot of Muslims that are living as minorities in non-Muslim societies. But if we were to take uh, a look at the bigger picture, uh, there are two billion Muslims in the world out of seven billion people. That forms a majority. That's the Muslims happen to make up a sizable majority in the world. Uh, if we were to break down the nation-state structure and we were to really compose uh, one ummah, as much as we talk about it, uh, there's no need to consider minority status uh, of Muslims in non-Muslim countries. Uh, what we uh, ought to be striving for uh, is to have the same kind of Islamic Ummah that the Prophet had. This doesn't mean that uh, all the people in that Ummah will be Muslims. What it does mean though is that uh, the decisions that are being made in that society of that Ummah uh, are being by, made by a group called al Ladina Amanu, that critical mass of people that ensures uh, for the rest of society that their covenant relationship with Allah is observed and uh, that they are maintaining fidelity to that relationship as al with Allah the sole power, the sole legislator, the lawgiver uh, and uh, the one that we all return to. How many volumes of this tafsir are ready so far? Um, so far six are in print, the first 35 ayat of Surah An-Nisa, that is the sixth volume. Uh, the seventh volume is set to come out any time now. Uh, that will be through the 86th ayah of Surah An-Nisa. And uh, volume 8 will conclude all of Surah An-Nisa. And then volumes 9 and 10 uh, will cover uh, Surah Al-Ma'idah. Uh, we expect that uh, by the end of this project, we'll have about 35 to 40 volumes altogether. Um, and so when we get through volume 10, we'll be through about one-fourth uh, of the Qur'an. Um, uh, we started this project uh, about uh, three and a half years ago. Uh, uh, Imam al Rasi actually started uh, writing the tafsir about uh, 13 years ago. And um, uh, the publishing end just started about three and a half years ago. And uh, I'm the editor. And so we uh, expect uh, that uh, uh, within the next uh, Ten years, uh, inshallah, that we'll finish the entire project and um, uh, and get through to the end of the Quran. Um, right now, the tafsir, uh, each volume uh, consists basically of about uh, uh, four to five hundred pages. Uh, it gives an in-depth explanation of uh, the ayat of the Quran in uh, with regard to the modern world that we live in. Uh, it brings in uh, 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 facts, it uh, brings in ideas, it um, uh, brings in uh, quite a bit of information uh, that's related to the world that we live in so that uh, people can understand the meanings of the Qur'an in a practical way uh, as opposed to just in a spiritual way. Uh, an obvious question is where can people obtain copies of this tafsir? Uh, currently the tafsir is available on Amazon uh, the first six volumes are available, and as soon as the seventh volume is published, it will be available on Amazon as well. Uh, it can also be purchased from uh, the ICIT website, uh, the Crescent International website. Um, and we expect that it will be available soon uh, in, in electronic format, and, um, and uh, anybody in the world would, should be able to download it if they have... Uh, uh, an e-book reader such as uh, uh, such as uh, a Kindle or any of those other devices like an iPad. Uh, 
And so very soon we expect to have all the volumes in electronic format uh, available on a wide variety of sites uh, for people to buy. Now, you mentioned that um, so far six volumes have been produced and uh, they uh, cover only up to ayat number 35 of Surah An-Nisa. So essentially, the first three surahs of the Quran up to the end of Ali Imran have been dealt with completely. And now the sixth volume only covers up to ayat number 35 of Surah An-Nisa. Uh, it seems to me that uh, this is going to run into many more volumes than perhaps uh, the 35 or 40 volumes that um, you mentioned. Uh, would an average Muslim be able to read such a vast amount of uh, literature? Uh, uh, we, uh, this is just an estimate. Um, I think that when people take a look at this uh, and they look to the end of the project and they think that, okay, uh, you know, reading even 35 volumes is a daunting task. Uh, as I'm saying, let us take a look at the world around us. Uh, uh, and not just the situation of Muslims. Uh, uh, there are people that go uh, to school uh, and they learn about governance. Uh, they learn about human relationships. Uh, they learn about uh, uh, how to formulate a government, how to formulate policy, uh, how to conduct uh, treaty arrangements. And uh, in the process of doing that, uh, they don't only read 35 volumes, they read hundreds of books and they go through perhaps thousands of papers in order to be able to effectively function in those positions. Um, we Muslims in the world are tasked uh, with being the witnesses for other ummas. And if we don't, uh, if we are not up to that task, uh, then uh, we can't be characterized as the finest ummah that was extracted interactively uh, out, of, uh, out of the other ummas that exist on earth. Uh, we have a responsibility to go out and uh, help the rest of humanity uh, observe their relationship with Allah and thereby be free. And for that we need education. We need to understand the Qur'an. And so if there were a hundred volumes or if there were two hundred volumes, we need to be uh, apprised uh, of the information that's contained in those volumes in order to be able to properly fulfill uh, our responsibility on earth. Um, now that being said, uh, you know, I'm the editor of this tafsir and every volume that's produced uh, I must go through and read it uh, uh, seven or eight times before it goes out into, uh, into print, uh, before it's released for people to buy. And I would have to tell you that it's a very easy read. Uh, this is not uh, a book that's written for, uh, for academics, uh, it's written for the common man. Uh, it, it doesn't have a uh, you know, $10 words in it that are, <laughs> that are used for academics or, or for scholars. Uh, this is meant to give guidance to the common man and more particularly it's meant uh, to help uh, those who are involved in the Islamic movement uh, to be able to fulfill their responsibility of showing direction uh, not only to the Muslims but to the rest of humanity. I'm afraid I'll have to end there. We are out of time but I want to thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts with us and shedding light on this very, very important aspect, which is the uh, tafsir of the Noble Quran by Imam Muhammad al -Asi. Thank you, Barakallahu uh, That's all the time we have for today, uh, but we hope that you will join us um, next week, same time, same channel. Uh, until then, uh, thank you for watching Muslim Perspectives. I'm Zafar Bangash. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The Ascendant Quran, realigning man to the divine power culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best known Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad Al Asi. Three volumes of this multi volume tafsir are now available from Crescent International at a special price of $40 per volume, including shipping anywhere in North America.